Jira, then um, Jira would be great. That would be that would be great for us. Um, so does anyone have experience with other worlds like this that has other ideas, perhaps? Anyone? No. Uh, Ned. I don't yeah. know. Can you hear me? I can, Peter. Yes. Uh, so one of the problems that I've had with Jira in the past is just sort of navigating the initial creation of a ticket, like picking a project. Right. Is that clearer now somehow? or? Well, so if you look at the link that I put into the announcement of the first RC, it's a Jira link that pre-selects the project. In this case, the project is just community reported issues. And we figured, we knew up front that it would be hard for people to decide what project, so we just made a project just to be sort of the- Okay, great. Or for people who don't want to think about it. Um, and that also, that link also pre-populates the subject of Hawthorne problem, colon, you know, to hopefully help you get more information um, in there without thinking about it. What I don't know is whether people have Jira accounts or whether some people are willing to make Jira accounts in order to make those things happen. So we're going to be keeping an eye on how people report problems with the RC. Um, so the future of Hawthorne is that the RC will be out in the community for probably 10 days to two weeks. Um, full disclosure, I'm on vacation all next week. So I'm looking forward to your efforts testing it while I'm away. Uh, and then the week I get back, we're going to look at how things are going and maybe call it off on the real. Any other questions about Hawthorne and how it's going? Uh, about Jira. Yeah. Uh, do the Jira tickets come up in the Google search or because I never, never seem to find any That's tickets via Google. That's a question. Um, I guess our Jira is not searched by Google. That's very likely. Um, I'm not sure if that's something we can make happen. Because I think it, then it's a big problem because when I, mo most of the time people use Google and, and they find GitHub issues because they're on Google. Yep. No, I understand the discoverability of, of already written issues is, a, is very important. Um, and we'll have to factor that in when we think about how, how this could be done. This is the first time I've heard this issue, by the way. Um, but that's something. So, I don't mind about 8,000. Oh, so someone here just tried it and says that Google finds about, finds about 8,000 issues in our Jira. 8,000 or But. But that's Confluence. But there are some Jiras in there. All right. So apparently Google is indexing our Jira, but maybe it's not considering them interesting enough to give them to you in search results unless you specifically search it. So maybe we can look at an, into a way of providing a uh, focused search that would let you search that too. That was an excellent point, Sam. Thank you. Any, any other thoughts or questions about Jira bug reporting, Hawthorne, any of that? All right. Anybody, uh, anybody have any early feedback? Uh, like, have you tried the release candidate? Anything like that? Anyone? I have. Anyone else? <laughs> yeah, because if, if it works for us, we're just going to release it unless we hear otherwise from <laughs> people. Uh, right. <laughs> That's what I well, I noticed Samuel seems to be sitting out by a river. Samuel, can you give us a shot of where you are right now? <laughs> Oh, nice. Yeah, it's nicer than my location right I want, now. I want to go where he's going. <laughs> Are you ready? Okay, so next thing, so that's it for Hawthorne. Hey, thanks for the view. <laughs> I appreciate it. <laughs> um, okay, so I think next on the agenda was Jeremy. I don't know if Jeremy is. Yeah, oh, he's online. oh, hey, there you are, sir. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Um, would you like to give us the latest on Inker? Is it INCR Inker? How do you pronounce that? That's the first thing. Yeah, I've been calling it Inker. Inker. Okay. Okay. Short for incremental little updates. Okay. Um, incremental improvements. So there is an OEP for this there, which is at the end of the review period. If anyone has any last words they want to put in, like, please do so quickly. Otherwise, we're going to be finalizing that. Just a few little like, edits based on the last feedback we got. And the 
project in there for Python 3 upgrade is active. One ticket has already been finished. Another one is just about done. I would love to see more activity on this. If anyone is looking for a way to get involved in the code base or wants to help out with the Python 3 upgrade, uh, please go ahead and dive in, start claiming and working on tickets, and get you back, be back as soon as we can. Cool. And to reiterate what you had said last month when you introduced this project, what is, what is the overarching purpose of Anchor? Yeah, so the general idea behind this is to have a set of good starting tickets or just like small tickets for people who are, or, so either people who are completely new to the code base and just want to get started working on something useful or people who are already familiar with code base and just want a nice bite sized thing that they can just fill a small chunk of time with. So most of the things in there should be doable just like within a few hours and don't require any significant knowledge of the existing code base. Um, most of the tickets that are in there currently assume that you have some basic knowledge of Python development, GitHub and such, but nothing specific to open edX. It's just general Python development community tools. So if, if you're looking for a way to get started uh, as a contributor to open edX, this is the, the perfect place to start, would you say? Yeah, and we'll probably will be adding additional projects in there later that are good starter um, tickets for people whose background is more in front end development or documentation, translation, et cetera. Perfect. Thank you. No, this is a very important project. Good to see uh, progress being made. Thank you. Uh, okay, so thank you, Jeremy. Up next is Namisha um, talking about some architecture theme roadmap stuff. Yeah. Everybody, um, let me share my, my screen. So what I wanted to do was just give you guys a, a preview of something that we have started working on, which is to give an idea of what the architecture theme or theme here at edX is going to focus on over the next year. So this is all available on our wiki. It's under the architecture theme uh, space within the architecture project. There's a, a, a document here called Architecture Roadmap 2018-2019. And um, what I've done is I just created a visual which provides like a Dependency diagram essentially of things that we are the pro main goals and projects that we're going to be working on. So um, what I'll do is actually let me just share this link in chat in case. Uh, First question is: can, yeah. can everyone hear Namisha and can everyone see that her shared screen? Right. Yes. No. Maybe. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. Cool. <laughs> um, and, okay, so what I'll do though is I'll, I will just post this in case you guys need to follow um, me from there. And let me just go back here. So uh, in the center, right, you'll see like the design principles. And so at the Open edX conference in my talk, I did just focus on basically the center. I didn't give people really an idea of the, of the projects that we were working on. So that's what this document will address. Um, but um, so using domain driven design, solid principles, evolutionary architecture, reactive, all that. If there are any other architecture enthusiasts out there and want to read more up on it, there is another uh, wiki page also in the architecture uh, Confluence side called Architecture Recommended Reading List. And uh, so feel free to, uh, you know, go ahead and check it out. We have internal at edX had some book clubs in the past where we've uh, read through some of these and we've captured some of our book club notes and whatnot. So um, we haven't yet expanded that out with the community, but who knows, maybe the next one we might. So, uh, but anyway, these are these design principles that upon which a lot of our thinking and design mindset is built upon. The primary thing is time to market, evolvability. Basically, we wanna be able to very quickly add features or changes to our system and deliver that quickly. And that is our primary goal for the architecture for the next year. Um, Along those lines, the trifecta does include approachability and extensibility as other things that will help us be better about our time to market. And so just to touch upon that quickly, with approachability, we're talking about, uh, you know, making it so that it's easier for developers to um, onboard to our system and understand our system and so forth. And so that, there's two things, minimizing code complexity and um, having developer documentation that is sustainable and maintainable. 
And for extensibility, our primary focus initially would be around theming and plugins. I'll go into a little bit more of detail on that. Um, and you guys can also feel free to ask questions on our Slack channel for architecture at any time and so forth. And for time to market, the primary things that we're going to focus on are around split front ends, which this is Ari's talk around having a back end front end split. So um, we're going to put a lot of efforts in trying to get to that by having support via APIs as well. And then things that are high, uh, you know, disabled here, those are uh, things that we are not going to intentionally target this year, but we do see that those things will also help with, um, you know, time to market and so forth. So, and that's event streaming and break, breaking up the monolith. These are things that we might eventually tackle, but not something that we're um, intentionally going to do at this time. Uh, and then uh, on the bottom here, you do see block store and adaptive learning. These are things that are resourced mostly by our community, but our architecture team is providing guidance and support on moving those forward. So um, uh, that's, yeah, so that's that as a big high level. Uh, in the detail level, I will go through this quickly once again, though, but if you guys have questions, definitely feel free. We might take some questions now, but otherwise, uh, you know, contact us later. So just to dive in a little bit when we're talking about minimizing code complexity, some of this you guys may have already seen, there was an OEP around deprecation and removal process. Mm -hmm. This is very important so we can, you know, remove things that are no longer needed. Uh, so what we've done is we're highlighting as we go and I'm gonna, it's gonna be a coloring game. Uh, but essentially, our goal is to color this through the, over the year. Um, but, you know, we're trying to, uh, right now we're working on a JIRA process to make it so that where we can actually go ahead and use what the OEP says about deprecating and removing things. And the old grades API, V0, might be the first one that goes through that process um, because now we have V1 thanks to a, a Microsoft contribution. Uh, another thing about the minimizing code complexity was this other OEP around feature toggles and that too, we need that to try to keep our complexity low. Um, and then there's other things around developer docs and some ideas that we have. Uh, OEP one and improvements on that was around architecture decisions. And another OEP around developer documentation is under works, um, but not yet released. So that's that. Uh, and I won't go into extensibility that much right now, but we know I can if we have questions. The time to market, that's this upper right hand quadrant is where our main focus is right now. And for split front ends, right, we have being able to independently deploy, this is on the release side, you know, front ends from the back ends is what our target is because we do feel that that is going to uh, help us move very quickly and quickly deliver fe uh, front end features. A shared header footer is a universal header footer that we can then use across all of our uh, microservices. So, and then to help along those lines with split front ends are our API uh, projects that we are gonna do. So basically create a good solid foundation for us to build APIs quickly for front end developers as well as for other features. So to dive into that a little bit, this is our plan for API development. We want to have authentication and authorization are like basic fundamental things, which are unfortunately our platform doesn't do a great job consistently throughout. Uh, so we're going to invest some time in that. Uh, using JOT tokens as a means of communicating uh, and authenticating to our services and allowing e more easily uh, single sign-on capabilities so we can go across our microservices. So, and then authorization is something that we have started working on a little bit with our OAT scopes work uh, and, you know, basically pushing that through and enabling on our website as well as enabling it throughout our, our open edX repos as well as is work that we'll be doing. And talking about roles and permissions, and I know others have also asked questions on it, like that is something that we do want to do and these are all very important parts of our API story to enable things that we want to do this year. And then things that do that will be coming along the way are best practices around APIs. People have been even in the Slack channel asking about creating new APIs for us, which is awesome, but we don't have right now great conventions. We need, to, we need someone to help us lead the effort on writing that OEP so that we can all start having a standard and convention, uh, conventions around creating our APIs. So 
This is work, as you can see, is not yet shaded. We haven't yet started on this, but it's something that um, we do definitely see the need for it, and we're hoping that we'll get to that at one point, unless someone else um, beats us to it, which is awesome. So, um, and then documentation around APIs as well. There's some work that we started doing with Swagger, but we need to carry that forward. Uh, and all, all the way on the end of this is basically, we're hoping that we have a good story around what APIs are available in our system. And there is another wiki document, which right now is just in Confluence, but eventually once we do get around to writing OEPs for APIs, you will um, see this out around for review. But you know, having an idea of like, we have APIs that we need for development. We have APIs that we'll need for plugins and extensibility. And then we'll have APIs that we might want to have more governance around to create API as a product. So this wiki here just takes a stab at classifying what those are um, and sort of a vision of where we'd like to go around that. Cool. So yep, that's all I had for now. Excellent. Thank you, Nerisha. So if you're like an external developer, what's the, what's the right or best way to get started as far as working with you on any part of this? What's the best place to, to start? Well, I think uh, the reason I also want to share this is that so you guys have an idea of what we're planning to tackle this coming year. And, um, and so and if we're aligned on, um, you know, working together on some of these initiatives, I think that will be great. So things that, for instance, are grayed out are things that we're not going to be able to tackle, like, you know, enhancing the xblock framework for instance and things like that and so those you would definitely or you know you you won't get as um much support from our end because we are um trying to do all the other other things so i think from that perspective if there are things here that you see for instance that are not even colored in like for instance around sustainable developer docs and you want to help us with automating tools for finding developer documentation or, or you know things like that you know these are things that would be awesome to have the community help out if they have resources cool yep all right thanks a lot namisha appreciate the the update um today we had a session from our data engineering team um abdul manan and andrew zaft yep. so abdul, I think that's a slide. okay uh, abdul are you uh are you online? Yeah, I am here. Fantastic. Here. Okay, so you have a slide? Uh, yeah. Okay. Can you share my screen? Yeah. Do you know how to do it? <laughs> yep. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> ah, beautiful mountaintop. Thank you. Oh. That's so sick. Uh, can you see my screen or you're still seeing my. Uh, actually, right now we're having. A technical difficulty, but uh, hang on a second. Looks like it just pops up. Yeah, full screen now. We're good. Ah, here we go. Uh, ah, yes, thank you. you. Excellent. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can see your screen. Thank you. Okay. Um, so a bit of an introduction about myself before I start. Um, my name is Abdul Manan, and I'm from RBSoft, working as a data engineer at edX. Um, so for today's meeting, I have two topics in my agenda. Uh, first is uh, the Docker analytics stack, and the second is the inclusion of Spark in edX analytics pipeline. So starting with Docker, um, we have Dockerized the analytics stack. Um, it, it's been a month, and we, are con uh, you, we have been using that um, since then. Um, and it has received a couple of upgrades. Um, as compared to the Vagrant based analytics stack. Um, first is that uh, there, it has drastically reduced the uh, development setup time. Uh, so for, with the Vagrant based data analytics stack, people who have used that, they know that it takes quite a lot of time and there were quite a lot of issues that, that needs to be fixed there. And we have addressed all of them in Docker analytics stack and um, so the development setup time using the new analytics stack uh, is around seven to 15 minutes, depending on the network speed, which is uh, a lot better than uh, the Vagrant based. Um, second is that uh, we have added support for Vertica, which is a warehousing database. Um, so 
we, we have been using internally Vertica uh, in edX. Uh, so because we couldn't add the support in Vagrant base, uh, Vagrant analytics stack. Um, so with the, with the new analytics stack, it's been added and anyone who wants to try out or in the community, they can do, the, do that using the uh, Docker analytics stack. Um, so regarding the analytics stack, that's, um, um, so for Vertica, we are using community edition 7.2 with the, with the license of one terabyte. So that's okay with the, for development purposes. Uh, um, so that's, that's the upgrades uh, from the uh, Docker perspective. Second thing that, uh, that I wanted to highlight is about uh, Apache Spark and uh, how we have, um, so we have been working with, with Spark um, for last uh, six to seven months and we have converted some workflows uh, and uh, gave a production trial to those workflows in our EMR environment. And so far the results have been promising. Um, our, our production trial uh, states that we have received around 40 to 60% performance improvement uh, from those workflows uh, as compared to the MapReduce or Hive workflows, so th which is a huge thing for us. So we have decided to uh, convert our um, uh, our MapReduce, Hive, uh, and, and, and Scoop workflows to, to Spark. Um, so for, for Spark, we have also included support, uh, uh, infrastructure support in the Docker analytics stack. And we have also uh, uh, provided support for in the pipeline repo. So um, we, there is a standalone cluster, a standalone Spark cluster, which is available with the uh, Docker analytics stack, um, which we have been using and uh, to develop Spark workflows and then run them on production. So it, it's pretty helpful for, for, uh, for us for development purposes. Um, so um, regarding, um, so, so the Docker uh, uh, infrastructure support, uh, support is added and we have also added, uh, recently added uh, support in our master branch uh, for Spark based workflows. Uh, we have documented all the stuff in our readme's and at the read the docs uh, documents uh, as to how people or anyone can use that to uh, make, some make some contributions or uh, to actually run that in the Docker. Um, so, um, we, uh, so we have listed down all the workflows that needs to be converted to be converted for, for Spark. Um, there is an epic for that in our Jira. Um, with the, uh, and right now there are uh, almost 30 to 40 workflows in there. Uh, we have been working on um, Spark, uh, Spark and Vertica connectivity and as well as Spark and MySQL connectivity. And uh, uh, we will be uh, adding the support for Vertica and MySQL uh, in the future. But um, so uh, we, we, we have always uh, welcomed uh, contributions from open source. So anyone who wants to try out uh, Spark with the analytics pipeline or uh, just want to see, uh, get the hang of it or uh, see the difference, uh, they can actually do that by contributing uh, uh, from, by following that Jira ticket. They can pick up any ticket from there. Uh, there are a couple of uh, larger ones or smaller ones whatever suits, they can just dive in and see how Spark works with the analytics and how much performance we are, uh, we can get from this. Great. So, uh, so there, uh, for contribution, um, uh, you can follow the guide on our readme docs and uh, uh, you can al also reach out to us via Slack channel and Google groups channel. Um, I'm gonna just share this link in, in, in the chat and uh, on the open Slack channel as well. So, and if you need any help, you can also contact us uh, via these uh, communication pool channels. Thanks. That's yeah. really, uh, this is really great to hear. Is there any, um, are there any goals as far as when you would like to have this released? Um, you know, like. So, 
it quote unquote finished, you know, yeah. even though it's not. I think I, I can speak a little bit to this. Sure. <clears throat> so we got a fair amount of work that's going on here. The goal that we're trying to do is replace everything that's met, reduce, and uh, hive. Uh, and that's a pretty big goal. So we don't have an end date on what that is. But what we're going to be doing is choosing the highest value workflows first. So we're still doing a little bit of discovery work, but it's mostly towards the highest value workflows. <clears throat> In terms of a timeline when that's done, I'm really not sure. <laughs> okay, cool. <laughs> All right. We're talking quarters. All we're right. Not, we're not talking months. So sure. Well, right. you can you can go to the uh, analytics channel in Slack and uh, discuss it there. Um, any any questions on that before we uh, before we move ahead on the agenda? Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. So the most statement that I do have is that so we still built a vagrant box for the most recent Hawthorne edition. That's not going to be the case anymore. <clears throat> we're going to be going Docker full in the future. So we're totally deprecating everything that's vagrant. Cool. That's no more vagrant. After, after Hoffman. So after Hoffman Hawthorne. Okay. has Docker available in it, but it's the, all the documents point to vagrant. Oh. <laughs> so, but that's not going to be the case. Awesome. <clears throat> okay. Great. Hey, thanks, guys. This, is, this sounds really great. Uh, exciting. And uh, look forward to having uh, some more updates on this in the future. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. And then for our. The last part of our what's new and exciting, uh, we've got Samuel is going to make, uh, I guess, a brief, give us a brief update on Friends of OpenEdX and the Richie portal. Samuel, are you here? I know I saw you before. You were on the river. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> not, not much update on Friends of OpenEdX. Okay. Um, anything we we discussed with Ned, we discussed with Ned, so I was waiting for his feedback. Project that we started on which is going well. So, any uh, yeah. any idea when you're going to have the Richie repo moved over into the Friends of OpenEdX organization on GitHub? We have uh, converted the repository to a distributable app. So, on the model of Django Oscar, we now have the project is a sandbox and the app is. Uh, inside and it's pushed to Wi-Fi, so that's already done. Okay. So that means that now the project is ready for, for, for reuse. Okay. So I think we're ready to, to move it. I was just waiting for... Hey, Kim, well, we're, we're having difficulty hearing you because of the background noise. Yeah, because of the background, yeah, that's right. I know. But <laughs> if, you can, um, if you could just put the URL into the chat as well as onto the wiki, and that way other people can find it, and I'll make sure to direct people there when, uh, when I yeah. put it online. Elsewhere. Okay. But that sounds really great. It sounds like you've made a lot of progress there, and I look forward to the future updates um, as well. But, that's uh, it's very exciting to hear. Uh, thank you. Okay, thanks. All right. So, okay, now onto our show and tell where we're going to start um, doing demos. Just a reminder that if you want, if there's something you're working on that you want to show, uh, please add your name to the agenda for next month. Um, and uh, if you don't, I have a habit of going around and, and asking you to do it anyway. So, uh, so if you if you do it before I before I ask you, then you get a cookie. Um, so first on the agenda is uh, we got Anna from uh, uh, from Campus IL. Anna, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Can you hear me? Can you hear you loud and clear. Oh, great, great. So uh, I'll share my screen and then I'll uh, I'll tell a couple of words about uh, Campus IL and about myself. If you're not familiar with, so we're Campus IL is the Israel National. Uh, digital learning platform um, and we're just like a couple of months ago started the development um, uh, on our open edX uh, instance um, and so what I wanted to share with you is uh, our a new sign up form that we have been working on for the last month so we are a national digital platform and we have a variety of, uh, of learners uh, from different backgrounds. And we've just found out that um, the main uh, pain point for most of our users is the sign up process. We actually have a bounce rate of 30% users that are leaving our platform. Uh, during the sign up process, um, it was like the number one pain um, in our platform. Um, and so we, we decided to tackle that as one of, um, one of the first issues that we're handling in during the process. And we uh, 
designed a new screen um, a new process um, and there are some uh, some features and nice to have issues that we also wanted to share with the community uh, and we've already opened uh, PRs for them and they're in, in, in the review process so the main idea is to make the process of uh, signing up as simple as possible here so we just removed all um, uh, all the fields here that are not uh, uh, that the user doesn't have to fill and, and we've also created a tooltip for the public username uh, because we just found out that uh, users didn't realize why they need a username so once you have your full name why do you need to fill out the, the username so once you fill and sorry I'll, I'll write it in Hebrew it was also a very big issue here like why the public username username had had to be in English we're a national platform so that's like uh, that's a must so okay sorry uh, so once you write something in in Hebrew you just see a name generated here um, uh, and it also will work if you sign up with any of the uh, SSOs here so if you go with Google uh, and I'll just sign up oh wait a minute uh, that's another user okay I'll just sign up uh, with my uh, husband's account awesome. Sorry. no no wait a minute uh, so uh, so you have this automatic suggestion for the username wait a minute there you go Okay, so here's my husband. He's writing his name in, in English and you have a tooltip for the public username as well. Um, that's one improvement which is very crucial for us. Um, and there is another improvement. Um, we, we want to allow our users to start using the platform as quickly as possible without adding any additional uh, details but we still do want the users to add these details like after they start the learning process so we added some kind of notification here once the data is not uh, filled during like after you make the sign up process you have a notification that reminds you to go and and, and provide us with the additional information great uh, yeah have you, have you noticed a change in like the number of people who stay through the sign up? Like you said, you were losing thirty percent before. Have you noticed that change since you went to the new sign up? Uh, yeah. So unfortunately, this is uh, on our staging environment. We didn't put it in production because of several reasons. We we're planning to do that, uh, but we expect it to be uh, much less. Um, uh, I wanted to just to share with you. Uh, two of, of the PRs that we created and, and uh, contributed to the community. One is, is with the username hint that I just uh, showed you. And okay. The other one is the incomplete profile notification. Th this is our internal Jira, but there are all, already PRs created here on, on, uh, Great. on the, the so, master. So we've got Matt over here who like is kind of like the first line of defense for, uh, for incoming uh, requests. I don't know where these are in the in the process, but we'll definitely uh, look into that and see what's going on there. I I have no yeah. idea the review process, but we can certainly yeah sure. We'll, we've already contacted Matt with with these ones, and and I, I know that uh, he's uh, taking care of us, but just wanted to share it with the community. Okay, cool, excellent. Thank you. This is uh, this will be uh, very helpful. I think. Yeah. Um, thank you very much. Awesome. All right. So. Uh, Thank you, Anna. Next on the list, looks like one is going to have to be deferred to next month because Omar is out sick. Um, but we do have Aaron and Nate talking about um, how AppSlumber tracks and measures open pull requests and visualizes trending data using Cortana. Um, you guys there? Yeah, I'm here. Hey, John Mark, thanks. Hi, howdy. Um, yeah, is there, is there anything you want to show on screen? or, or is Yeah, let me, let me pull that up right now. So while I'm doing that, hey everybody, I'm Aaron Beals, uh, I'm the VP of Engineering at AppSimbler. Uh, we are been in the OpenX community for quite a while. Um, we, for those of us, those of you who went to the uh, conference, we met a lot of you there. For those of you who couldn't make it, um, we 
I do a lot of do a lot of hosting and management of open edX sites, both uh, individual uh, edX sites and also um, and also uh, edX sites through our our SaaS platform. Um, so what we we often have to do as a company is we have a, a set of internal um, uh, we have a set of projects. We have the the you know we have edX platform of course, edX configs, e-commerce. We have all the the open edX platform. Uh, uh, repos. We also have a bunch of our own repos we, uh, we use as well. And one of the challenges we face as a team is um, closing out PRs. Um, and I know we, we all have this problem, right? I know nothing about that. I have no, no. idea. No, we never have that problem, but yes, <laughs> go for it. <laughs> yeah, so de definitely a problem. One of the challenges I had um, throughout the team uh, as the VP of engineering was, was, you know, how do people are blocked off and across teams. So we have a team that's uh, distributed, uh, fully distributed um, around the world. We have eight different time zones with people that often travel. So um, there's often, oftentimes built in lag in, in PRs just naturally, uh, if you need a quick turnaround. Um, but then there's also, we have cross team PRs. Oftentimes we have a small team, uh, someone on another team needs to know, uh, needs, you need eyes from another team, you need their time. So, um, Often there, there, there are gaps in that. So we're making improvements to that process, but I really wanted some way to measure that. And so I threw this out and uh, Anders Pearson from our team who unfortunately uh, couldn't join today, otherwise he'd be presenting this. Um, he sort of heard that. I mentioned it in a, a sprint, sprint retrospective. I was like, oh, we gotta quantify this. How can we quantify it? And then he came back at the next sprint review and said, hey, look at this. <laughs> and uh, he, had, he had set up, um, a tool in Grafana, for those of you who don't know Grafana, you can go to grafana.com. It's an open platform uh, for doing analytics. Um, and what this is doing is this is pulling data from, uh, from GitHub. Um, it's using a Python script uh, just to talk to the APIs. It's a pretty basic script um, to pull out some data. Uh, it plugs it then. Um, he originally just put the data directly into to Grafana, but he's now using, um, he's been using Prometheus, if you aren't familiar with that. Uh, Prometheus.io, also, also uh, open source for monitoring. It's a way to sort of, um, uh, he's able to pull, toss the data uh, to Prometheus and then have uh, Grafana pull from that uh, and display the status of PRs. And so what you see here is we have the big dashboard of just, hey, there's 16 open PRs across our repos. Um, we can see PRs here. Um, you can see whether their work's in progress, they're mergeable or with reviews. And there's some criteria we use for this. Um, just very basic. They essentially did a pass its test or not. Um, so this is not subjective. This is pretty uh, objective based on uh, your the uh, the configuration in GitHub. And then finally, you know, by, by repo. So you can see you can see we have a lot of um, edX configs, <laughs> open PRs. We need to close out. Some of these are old. Um, we have mean age of, age of PRs in hours. Um, so we were able to see um, how long <laughs> things have been sitting around. So some of these you see are a high number of hours. We've got a few outliers we've got to knock down. Uh, we're, we're, we're up in the thousands of hours here. We have a few, <laughs> a few skewing um, our numbers. But this allows us, this gives us metrics that we can use then um, to measure how effective we're being in, um, in the efforts, we, you know, our efforts to close up PRs. And so we're able to change timelines here too. You're looking at the last week for us, but we can look at the last month um, and able to, we're able, I'm able to see on a sprint by sprint basis how, how effective our efforts are. So I think this has been- You ever, you measure in units of hours as opposed to uh, uh, like days or weeks, but. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can certainly change that. Um, I think days would be much more effective here. Um, I'd like to be able to measure in hours. That'd be wonderful. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, all right, cool. Uh, thanks. Sure. Thanks guys, I uh, appreciate the, the demo. Sure. Um, next, and then finally, last but not least, uh, we have pilots of the new journals feature. Um, is Bill Filler, yes, yeah, you're right, thanks. Uh, it's coming Bill, I guess you can use But you're gonna have to stop that. <laughs> Do you want, um, I'm gonna mute here, so I'll just use your mic. You wanna use your mic too? Yeah. Okay. All right, go for it. Hey everybody, uh, my name is Bill Filler and I am an engineer here at edX. Um, I work on um, as part of the business team. Um, so as, as part of the uh, business team, we have a, a group called the White Label Group and I'm a member of that team. Um, part of what we do on the White Label team is, is make um, customizations to edX and build features that some of our White Label partners specifically request um, and one, so one of those features um, that a couple of our partners requested was this concept of something that we're calling journals 
Um, so what is a journal? Um, you can think of a journal as really um, a collection of resources, um, of different types of contents, uh, videos, images, documents. Um, that, and the thing that's kind of unique about it, it's, um, it's not tied to a course specifically. So it's, it's another type of entity um, that we're developing um, as a pilot for these customers, but we're building into the Open edX platform um, as a way to kind of market and be able to um, host uh, different types of journals on the Open edX platform. Um, so as, as I mentioned, it's not tied to a course. Um, it can pull resources from a course. And another unique thing about a journal is that um, it has a, a sort of an expiration date. Um, so we're kind of uh, moving toward a subscription model for it. Um, and another thing that's unique about it, as opposed to a course, is you can think of it as a resource that's constantly updating um, its content. So if you think about a subscription model and you think about this type of resource that um, authors are frequently updating, uh, the idea is to kind of give um, users uh, a way to kind of in ingest brand new content um, that, that's pretty frequently changing. Um, so I'll give you a brief demo. So that's a little bit of the background of it. And then um, I'll tell you how we solved the problem and how it affects Open edX. So we essentially created a new type of product um, called a journal. And you can see on the on the home page here, we're displaying a card for a journal. Um, you know, here's a course, here's a journal. Um, if I click on learn more, this is actually going to bring us to the marketing page for the journal, which is actually hosted. Um, so we, we wrote a new IDA called the journal service. And the journal service is um, is serving up um, the marketing page and everything about a journal. So you can actually go ahead and purchase one just like you'd purchase a course. Um, so I'll sign in. Um, I've actually already purchased this, but you can essentially go through the flow here. And then when you're complete, um, you can see we've added a new dashboard called journals. And here's my demo journal. So the same way you see courses on your courses dashboard, uh, you see journals in your journal dashboard. And you'll notice here, um, zoom in a little bit, this has an expiration date. So your access expires um, on a certain date. So it's not a full blown subscription yet, but it's kind of like a, a hard um, expiration date that's configured. So then when I go to view it, um, again, it's going to the journal service. Um, and we're at, this is kind of a rough UI of how it will look, but essentially you'll have a table of contents um, and, and basically pages that you can build in, in the authoring tool, which I'll show you next, but you can have things like embedded videos with transcripts, images, um, you can embed documents in here, so PDFs or whatnot. Um, fully like full text search that will um, actually search not only through text, but also through transcripts of videos. So this is showing you some hits um, on a video. Um, this is showing you some hits on a document. So it's using elastic search behind the, behind the scenes here. Um, so essentially you can create this type of rich content, content um, in the journal service and display it um, you know, in open edX. Just real quick, I'll show you the authoring tool. So um, we use Studio to author courses as, as this uh, kind of workflow is a bit different and the purpose of this is different than a course. We decided not to use Studio, but um, we're using a content management system, an open source CMS called Wagtail to do the authoring. So you can see here, um, so basically what I just showed you Here's my demo journal, and essentially you can create pages and modify those pages. So if I want to edit my chapter, um, this is a CMS, you know, I can change the text. Um, I could add new types of content. These are the, the types of content that we support. So you can add images, rich text, PDFs, videos. Um, so once you do that, and you can just preview it, 
and you can see the changes straight away. Um, so Wagtail is a pretty rich editor. Um, it allows you to do stuff like um, unlimited kind of nesting of pages. Like right now, uh, you know, Studio has a limitation of kind of a certain fixed structure. Um, this, you can create multiple child pages um, and basically, uh, you know, um, it, it makes for, for a much more flexible system. So yeah, um, that's that's kind of an overview of it. But I, I guess the good news here is that um, we've had to develop. So we have a, a journal service, which is a standalone new IDA, and we also have um, uh, modules that are integrated into the edX platform, into e-commerce, discovery, and LMS. So you know, while this was developed for a white label partner, um, Open edX is getting the benefit of it because it's being built in a generic way that um, would be part of the platform. So you may have already covered this, so apologies if I missed it, but, but what exactly is the use case that you're targeting here? Like what is the, you know, what, um, like why would you do this? Yep, so um, our partners essentially, they, they wanted to make the journal as, um, to think of it as like a addendum to a course. So um, it's a place where, um, community can kind of um, access additional information like after a course is ended and it can be kind of continually updated so a course kind of has a life right you have your your enrollment period and then the, the course ends at some point so this was um, our partners wanted this as a way to continuously have something that's um, that learners can refer to um, so that that's the main use case and okay. it, in the future looking to have like a community around that certain topic um, where there might be some you know tie into discussion forums and other um, yeah because the first thing that came to mind was like why couldn't I just use say WordPress for this or something like that as far as like you know designing and publishing content uh, that's most effect so you could but it wouldn't be tied into um, it wouldn't be Right. linked it all with your course and right. you have no way to kind of sell it and, and charge yeah. um, a, or have some sort of subscription model. So I think that's the difference. So they wanted something that was integrated into the edX platform um, that, you know, Great. would basically perform those features. Okay. That looks pretty interesting. Thank you. Thanks, Bill. Yeah, sure. Um, cool. All right. Well, we're coming to the, the end of our, uh, session, but um, before we do, uh, just a couple of quick updates. One, um, at Montreal we talked about having like a quarterly architectural discussion. I've been forbidden from using the term architectural council because apparently that was uh, not a raging success. Um, so look for some information uh, from us on that uh, shortly in the next few days. Um, basically as a, as a way to do kind of a Think of it as a miniature developer summit on a quarterly basis online. Um, and the second thing is, All right. Can you? All right. There you go. Uh, anything else anybody wants to uh, uh, to share with the before we before we break until next month? What was your second right. thing, John? We the audio cut out when you started oh. saying that. Okay. Sure. <laughs> Sorry, we have uh, a late addition to the uh, to the party. Here, I'll shove it on my computer. Okay. Uh, Do you want me to mute? Uh, yes, please. Hopefully this works. Hello, everyone. 
So hello, everyone. So those who may have met me at OpenEdX and those may, who may have not, um, I'm AJ Sanabin. I am the mobile team lead here at edX. Um, and I just wanted to quickly, Marco had asked me to quickly talk about um, our last couple of releases that just came out. And I'll just highlight those real quick. And I'll take maybe a minute, minute to do that. And then I'll let everyone go. Uh, where's the share screen on here? Right there. All right, uh, there it is. All right, great. Um, so just a couple of quick things that uh, we wanted to highlight. Uh, we have had two releases re in the last um, few months, uh, specifically 2.14 and 2.15 that went out for mobile. Um, the key features in those, those releases are improved video streaming quality to include HLS support, um, bulk video download within subsections, um, and I'll show some images real quick in a, in a moment. Um, improved landscape support, which has been a really big request in our reviews here at edX uh, for both Android and iOS. Um, and uh, show popular subjects in our course discovery. Um, and all of these things, uh, specifically the show popular subjects is part of research we're doing to improve, improve discovery within the mobile applications. Um, but a lot of the other features are all built around um, review requests we've had uh, in both the Apple Store and Google Play. And then just a couple of numbers that Marco wanted me to highlight as well, um, mainly around our growth in the last fiscal year. You know, we've seen things, for example, of about 75% growth in uh, daily new installations, um, along with around 71% growth in daily active users. And a lot of these things all hinge around the changes we've been making within the application to improve um, usability, um, platform support, and um, trying to fix the things that the users are seeing in, in reviewing us the most on. Um, this has resulted in uh, great, pretty good improvements or, or great improvements really in our app review scores across the board too. Um, so just to quickly highlight with screenshots, the things that we've changed recently. Uh, 2.14, I mentioned um, HLS video support, um, the ability to download videos in bulk within a subsection and um, landscape and portrait support, and then lastly, the browse by subject. Um, this, is very, this is a common theme within our website, but now within the mobile applications, you can actually click into a different subsection, and it will load the search view for that subsection. Um, because I know we're at the tail end of the time blocked out for this, and I jumped in at the last minute, I can always be reached on the Slack channel for the mobile apps um, team, and we're pretty responsive on there and also by email. So thanks for letting me jump in at the last minute, John. Thanks, but I mean, you can have all the time you want next month. If you want. <laughs> Schedule, you really, yeah. really jump on the agenda. About, about, about what, what? Oh, oh you mean, mean the, uh, the discourse? discourse? Um, you know what, I'll follow up with uh, some notes about the discourse piece. Um, Later, so uh, I'll, I'll send out something, something in less less on Slack, Slack uh, about the discourse experiment. Look, look for something, something there in the next two to three weeks, uh, and look for something on the quarterly architectural meetup um, within the next week. And then uh, with that, there are people using this room, I think, so we'll have to exit soon. But thanks, everybody. Bye. Till next month. Oh, feel free to add your uh, item to the agenda for next month uh, whenever you want. And if not, I'll come uh, hunt you down. Thanks. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye. Au revoir. Au revoir. <laughs>